Evan, you're wanting something much more radical. Um, well, I want m much of that. I want Sir Charles Gray, uh, at least his proposals. But uh, yes, we do want more. And I think we're going to get, at the very least, a considerable amount. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was working with an organisation called Sense About Science, who were supporting Simon Singh's case. I know Simon's here. Um, and, uh, and I was also dealing with um, blasphemy repeal and criminal defamation repeal with Index on Censorship and Pen, who were doing a, a paper, uh, which they published just over a year ago now, on uh, libel reform. And I just thought it would be easier uh, and um, lead to a quieter life for me if they could come together in a libel reform campaign uh, to cut down the number of meetings. Well, they did come together. It increased the number of meetings. But we did achieve our initial aim, which was to get a clear commitment for legislative change, libel reform, in the manifestos of uh, all three parties. And, uh, and uh, what I consider to be the only successful outcome of the general election, if I can put it like that, uh, was that uh, the three parties were, had people elected uh, to Parliament on uh, that manifesto commitment. And it's not a surprise, uh, whatever else you say about the coalition, given that they both supported this, that they managed to uh, conspire uh, to have something in the coalition agreement that merged the two uh, commitments. And uh, the, the runes coming out, because it was combined obviously at the time with a, um, with a very clear set of recommendations for libel reform from the Commons Culture Media and Sports Select Committee, and I see Paul Farrelly MP here, uh, from that committee. Um, the, the runes coming out now are that we're certainly going to get something. It was then combined with, uh, it was then added to, the momentum was added to, by Lord Leicester's private members bill, and his private members bill have a tendency, private members bills have a tendency to become law, if not directly, then indirectly, a few months, a lot of nagging, uh, and uh, much debate uh, later. And there are a number of things in his uh, bill which he agreed to uh, hold or pull back while the government is committed to, a, uh, to publishing a draft libel reform bill in this session of Parliament, probably towards the end of March. So it's only slipped a few months, uh, but at the rate we're going, we will catch up with its publication date uh, because it's slipping slightly more slowly than the months are advancing. Uh, and to bring in a substantive bill the following legislative session, starting in May 2012. And, the, and there are a number of things that it will contain, which I just want to go through, focusing mainly, if I may, on the public interest aspect, which this debate was talked about. But the first thing to say is that the campaign is not actually uh, a, uh, strongly backed by uh, large media corporations. Okay? And in fact, their, their record on this is, is, is curious in that when the editor, managing editor of the Daily Mail gave evidence at the Select Committee, he actually was asked, you know, do you want a, a better statutory form of the Reynolds defence? And he said, no, he just wants uh, to sweep away a judge-made privacy law as he saw it. And he's probably very excited by today's developments in the Mosley case. But um, uh, so, so it's not a media-inspired uh, campaign, although clearly, uh, any reform will help, and it is d desperately needed, uh, to rejuvenate uh, investigative journalism, which is finding it extremely difficult because of the chill. And the problem is that we don't necessarily, I wouldn't describe the current law as claimant friendly or even defendant hostile, but it is free speech hostile. It is chilling in many ways, not necessarily because the defences aren't ultimately there, but because Defendants know that they will have to spend years in the process and may well end up out of pocket in the end, as the Guardian Ben Goldacre did when they won a case, and, uh, and as, as Simon Singh uh, may well do, uh, given that he's won his case, because of the impossibility or the great difficulty in recouping all the costs, even when you win and are awarded those costs. So uh, this happens not only in investigative journalism and in the media generally, but bloggers find that they're best advised to concede and take something down. ISPs, who are currently potentially liable if they fail to take down something that they're responsible for hosting, uh, uh, feel that they also have to retreat in the face of what may be uh, something that they feel they can <coughs> win on, and, and many of us feel they ought to win on. And of course, we know, uh, this 
my focus in particular, that the editors of even peer-reviewed scientific and scholarly journals find that they can't afford the investment of two or three of their staff's uh, salaries uh, uh, to contest a case, and that they better pull the, the offending, uh, though not, uh, in their view, defamatory or false words or statements, even in uh, something that is of critical public interest, which is scientific debate, for example, around healthcare or drugs. And this is a, a real problem and has been recognised, as I say, by all the parties. Uh, what I think we're going to see is a public interest defence. It's not going to be a statutory version of Reynolds. And what help would that be? Because there would be evolving common law for years, possibly decades, on how the statutory version of uh, a Reynolds-type uh, defence uh, would, would, would work. Uh, even if it stuck very much to the words, which I don't think it will do, uh, in some of the recent judgments uh, that have uh, created the common law Reynolds uh, defence. Uh, what we're going to see, I think, is a public interest defence which is going to hopefully be clear, but importantly, uh, have put diff a different standard uh, of behaviour to benefit from if it's in the public interest from responsible journalism or responsible publication, depending on the nature and context of the publication. So more will be expected of large media organisations to, to come under the definition of responsible journalism than would be expected of a uh, blogger. There will also, I think, be changes to uh, uh, the fair comment defence. There's been a, now a number of judgments arguing that that is a misnomer. I think people active in this area know that uh, comment doesn't have to be fair to benefit from that common law uh, defence. Uh, whether it's honest comment or honest opinion, that will probably be uh, made clearer. And there will be changes, I think, to the uh, justification uh, defence. In addition, I'm certain that there will be a single publication rule, uh, but I suspect there will be exceptions created where the needs of justice require there to be uh, a potential cause of action e even after a year when something's accessed. And one of the big questions will be what new protections will there be for, for example, internet service providers who are uh, not mere facilitators in the language of the 1996 Act, but uh, certainly it would be useful as far as we're concerned on the Libel Reform Campaign if the action was between the publisher, uh, the author, uh, and uh, the claimant, and that there wasn't uh, an imposition on hosts to take down uh, unless there was a court order uh, requiring them to do so down the line. Um, the key, I think, for the Libel Reform Campaign, and I, I speak on my own behalf, but we'll be publishing something on this shortly, will be not, I think, whether the defences are better after two years and hundreds of thousands of pounds, but whether there will be an easy way out to strike out cases that are of little merit. Those options do apply at the moment, but what we're wanting to see, and what I think Lord Leicester's bill did provide for, was very clearly a, a, an ability to get an early strike out where the threshold of substantive harm to a reputation in this jurisdiction had not been met, and that it is whether the publication in this jurisdiction adds additional harm of a substantial nature to any publication outside this jurisdiction, which is clearly not going to be constrained by, by laws. In addition, I hope that there will be much more uh, extensive uh, scope for statutory qualified privilege so that people can point to it and say that this action doesn't have a hope because it's clearly covered by qualified privilege, and I finish on uh, this point, that in addition, a thorny question will be, will we be able to successfully limit what is very chilling to public interest publication, and that is the ability of corporations to sue in libel? In order to do that, uh, and if they are not permitted to uh, sue in libel, which will release a lot of chill, we have to, I think, and I think this is recognised under uh, the uh, respect for the rights of others in Article 10.2 of, uh, of the ECHR, is to provide an alternative remedy which is satisfactory to them, which is an achievable uh, uh, action in malicious falsehood, where there is something published maliciously or grossly, ne recklessly, negligently, if you like, uh, uh, and uh, uh, which is uh, false and causes actual harm. And we need to develop the ability of companies to be able to obtain 
declarations of falsity, if this is the alternative option, so that they can then use through their, their own methods ways of saying, although we couldn't use defamation, you know, this shows that we were right and it was unfair. So that's a challenge, all those areas, but I'm confident that we've already banked about half of those, the ones at the beginning, if you like, uh, and uh, there's a great deal uh, more to still be striven for before and after the draft bill is published. But the key question will be, will public debate in the public interest be improved? That's what a vibrant democracy needs, and that's what, I'm afraid, the, the reputation of English and Wales as a, a law on defamation uh, has led many people outside to believe does not exist to the extent it should in this country. Thank you.